Hi, in today's video, we're going to be in John 5, verses 1 through 15. Jesus heals a lame man by the pool. The verses we're going to discuss today is the third miracle John records in his gospel. John only records, I think, eight miracles, and seven of them, or six of them, are exclusive just to his gospel. So we're going to see here that Jesus is the Lord over Sabbath, and after Jesus often performs a miracle in John's gospel, it leads to a teaching moment. This will lead into a great debate with the religious leaders about the Sabbath, and this miracle is also the catalyst that starts the opposition of Jesus from this religious establishment. The next few chapters will be nothing but confrontation for Jesus. So verses 1-15 through 15 in the NLT Bible says, Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the Pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of these men lying here had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and he knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, You can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, The man who healed me told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning, or something else, or something worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. So to break this down, verses 1 through 3, it says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was a pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. So John's going to make a geographical switch from Galilee to Jerusalem. So he moves to Jerusalem, and, it, and John tells us why he went to Jerusalem. He went there for one of the Jewish holy days. So there was three festivals or holy days required by all Jewish males to attend in Jerusalem. The festival of Passover and unleavened bread was one. The festival of the Pentecost, also called the festival of harvest or the festival of weeks, and then the festival of shelters. Jesus came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So he goes up and he keeps the feasts. He goes through all the rituals that he's supposed to as a Jewish male. But John doesn't tell us what feast it is, and scholars are divided, but it really doesn't play a role in what happens here. All we know is it draws him to Jerusalem where he can do this miracle. So inside the city, by the sheep gate, there was a pool, a pool of Bethesda. And this is called the house or the place of mercy. And notice Jesus gives mercy to a man in a place called house of mercy. So why the sheep gate? Back in Nehemiah, the sheep gate was mentioned, and it was a place by the wall of the city of Jerusalem where the sheep were kept outside. So they would bring the sheep for the sacrifice through this gate. And this pool of Bethsaida had five porches. And around this pool laid people who were blind, lame, or paralyzed, and they laid on these porches. So verse 4 is not in most of the newer Bibles. It's in the King James Version. But it reads this, Waiting for a certain moment of, of the water, for an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step in after the water was stirred was healed of whatever disease he had. So they went back to earlier manuscripts, manuscripts and they found out that a scribe added this later. That it wasn't in the earlier manuscripts so we don't know if it's actually a, a real thing or just a legend but obviously something had to be um healing these people for them to be laying there like that so every now and then the water would bubble up and they would go into that pool and they would be healed but wouldn't this be kind of cruel knowing that all these handicapped people were lying there and couldn't make it to the pool and do you think God would operate like this? The first come, first serve, only the first one that gets there would be healed? I don't know. I don't know if that would be cruel or not. 
Um, but it could be. It could be something that happened. We just don't know. And there's a lot of division on what it's about. But one scholar believes that there was probably around 300 people who lied under these porches, waiting on their opportunity to get in the pool. And during these festivals, there's probably a bunch more. But imagine being paralyzed, and then you got a guy there with a bum leg. I mean, you can't get in the pool, but he can run over top of you and get in there first. It would be frustrating. So verses 5 through 7, it says, One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, and he knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to get put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. So notice Jesus focuses on a single individual, just like he did at, at the Samaritan at the well. This time, he focuses on a man who had been sick for 38 years. So Jesus sees this man, he knew his condition, and he knew something about him. He knew his medical history, he also knew his physical history. So Jesus looked at him, and all it took was a look. Then he asked this man a question. He comes up and has a personal encounter with this man. He says, would you like to get well? Some people say this is a cruel question. It'd be like going into the hospital and looking at a cancer patient and say, would you like to be healed of cancer? You know, we don't think about asking somebody like that. But Jesus, all knowing in his sovereignty, he knows. He's getting to this man. He's going to get to this, this man and focus on the issue. He's focusing on his problem, his helplessness, and how bad his condition really is. Also, there's a lot of people who get in this state and they get beat down and they feel like they're not loved or, they're, or they feel like they're on an island or they're alone. And they're used to someone or they're, or they're used to someone waiting on them hand and foot and they don't want the responsibility of having to work or provide for themselves. So some of them don't want to be healed. But this man replies, I can't, sir. For I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else gets there ahead of me. So after 38 years, this man's problems became a way of life. No one had ever helped him before. He had no hope of being healed. Do you think anyone ever asked him, do you want to get better? Probably not. Probably nobody even cared about him. They probably tripped over him when they were trying to get to the pool. So he had a hopeless future. He's trapped in life situations like we all get. We get stuck in a rut, broken feeling deserted, with all hope lost. Here comes a man, a compassionate, caring, loving man. And that's Jesus. We don't need to lose hope. You see what Jesus will do for this man in his life, and this is the same thing he can do for us in our lives when we get broke down like this. God likes to help those who can't help themselves. God will give you grace on his time, in the Father's, Jesus in the Father's timing, and this time was that time. This was the place, and the way he would heal this man was no problem for Jesus. And remember, Jesus can walk on any of our problems. None are too big for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just like when the disciples were out on the, on the stormy water, Jesus walked on that thing that they were afraid of. He walked on that water. The longer a person is sick, the less likely he or she is going to get well. And that's an obvious fact. And the longer a person lives in sin the less likely he or she will come to Jesus Christ. And that's another fact. So remember, God is the master of all difficult situations, just like this one. It says in the Bible, with God, anything is possible. Jesus says, do you really want to change your situation? He's saying, well, I'm here to make that change. This man had no one, no help, but here he is, Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh, the help this man needed, the help that will help save this man. So verses 8 through 9a says, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. So here's the miraculous cure. The man was focused on the magical powers and traditional superstitions that got him nowhere. But when he met Jesus, all his expect expectations were met. If the pool was real and had healing powers, why didn't Jesus help, help the man to the pool? But here Jesus gives him a set of three commands. He says, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Jesus shows the lame man and all the people there that he is the source of divine healing. Miracles are better than magic. Jesus is better than some superstitious pool. 
And as you see here, like the Samaritan woman, Jesus sought this man out. You don't see anything about his faith here. He's not like that government official who had the faith to come out and kneel in front of Jesus and beg him in front of everybody. This man did nothing. Jesus came to him. Jesus picked one man. He could have healed a bunch or even all the people there that day, but he healed one man, and he did it for a purpose. Jesus picked this miracle to lead into a message, a sermon, or a learning session. Jesus will use this miracle to call out the religious leaders under extra burdensome laws that they made for Sabbath in their false religious system. Verses 9b through 10, But this miracle happened on Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, You cannot work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. So Jesus performed the miracle on Sabbath, and that became the point of the argument. They weren't worried about that the man was, who was crippled for 38 years was healed. No, they were worried about the man carrying a mat on the Sabbath. This man has, hasn't walked in 38 years, and they're not even worried about that. All they're worried about him is that mat rolled up under his arm. This was considered work, and it was un, unlawful. The problem is that what this man was doing didn't break any Old Testament law, but it broke the Pharisees' interpretation of God's command to remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. But like I said, they added hundreds of rules to God's law, making it a burden for the Sabbath to come. The Sabbath was supposed to be a day of rest, but it was actually a day of burdensome, ardent rules that most people probably couldn't stand when Sabbath even showed up. So worried about their petty rules more than a man who was just healed, their rules were more important than some man's poor life. And you'll read in other scriptures where he heals a man's hand on Sabbath, and they were so worried about him doing that on Sabbath and not the man being able to use his hand. So we get caught up in our own man-made structures and rules that we forget the people who are involved. And these people are bitter, vicious people, and they don't rejoice. They don't have no joy in their betterment of another person's life. As much as it did, it violated the laws that they had imposed over the written word of God. And John MacArthur says that this is a result of a false religious system. They, don't want, they want to keep the truth from everyone. They want to keep the people interested in what they have to say, not what God can do for you in your life. And, and what Jesus can do for you in your life. Jesus saves, but these, this religious system doesn't teach that. So Jesus knew that this was the Sabbath and he healed this man anyway to prove a point, which we'll see in the next video in the next set of verses. So he did this on purpose. He wanted to stir up the system. <clears throat> so verses 11 through 13 says, But he replied, The man who healed me told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. So this man knew nothing. He saw a man... The man asked if he wanted to get better. He said yes, and the next thing he knew, he was up and walking and carrying his mat. And they were trying to get to the bottom of who told him to carry that mat. And this man didn't know yet, but he's soon going to find out. And one thing I, I asked myself is, why did Jesus withdraw from the crowd? But he would have had a bow's eye on his chest. He healed this man. Don't you think everyone at that pool would be begging for him to heal him? And then the Jewish leaders would have been looking for him right away, and Jesus' time wasn't up yet. So he just retreats and gets out of there to avoid this situation. But this is going to be a turning point in Jesus' ministry. Doing this on Sabbath rocked these Jewish leaders to the core. They could not stand that he did this healing on Sabbath. So verses 14 through 15 says, But afterward Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning. Or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. And notice that Jesus found him. Jesus went and looked for this man and found him. Jesus has an intentional search for a stumbling beggar who had not yet figured out what to do with his new legs. And Jesus is looking for us the same way. As you become a Christian, we haven't figured it out yet. But he's looking for us. We need to listen to his voice. Listen to your inner conscience. Listen to his call. We're not, he's not the one that's lost. We are. This man was lame or paralyzed, and suddenly he could walk. This was a great miracle, but he needed a greater miracle. He needed his sins to be forgiven. He needed to be saved, just like we do. We need our sins to be forgiven. Or your fate's going to be worse than that par being paralyzed or the things that we have wrong with us in our lives. 
Jesus tells him that this illness that took away 38 of the best years of your life. But if you don't stop sinning, it's going to take away your eternity. Which is the problem. Which is the problem. He may have had this paralyzation or or because of the sins he did in the past. But what's worse than being paralyzed? An eternity in hell. And that's just like us. What's worse than having cancer? Or what's worse than having diabetes or AIDS or something like that? Is spending an eternity in hell. A lifetime of suffering is nothing compared to eternity. He tells them to stop sinning or repent. Turn away from your old ways or you're going to have a worse faith, fate than what you have now. And Jesus tells this man this because he loves him. He loves us the same way. He has a personal investment in each and every one of us because we're, we're made in God's image. So Jesus is telling him right now, I'm showing you mercy. But if you don't repent from your sins in the future, I will be your judge. So we need to ask ourselves this question. Did this man get saved? The Bible doesn't tell us. John MacArthur seems to think that the man went back to the religious establishment. That's why he told them that Jesus did it. So he could stay in good graces with this old religious system. I'm not sure. He could have he could have went and told him because of his gratitude. And he wanted him to know that, hey, this man named Jesus Christ made me walk. I don't know. The Bible really doesn't say either. But notice that that's not the case here. But notice this miracle that there is nothing about the faith of this man. But John tells us of this miracle because it's going to set up a long debate with the Jewish leaders about the Sabbath. And Jesus will have to school them about why the Sabbath was given and that Jesus is the Lord over the Sabbath. Let Jesus find you. He is seeking you. Listen to the call. Pray. Read your Bible and try to repent from your sins. Give your life to Jesus. Make him the Lord in your life. And Jesus can be your Sabbath where we can rest in Jesus. But the main thing is, is have faith in him. Know that Jesus can do what he says that he can do. This Bible is nothing but the truth. This Bible will never change. It doesn't matter what fad there is or what people think trying to take God out of everything. They can try to take God out of everything, but he's still there. He's our creator, and he'll never leave our sides. And remember, he's not the one that's lost. We are. And tune in the next week where we find out what this debate's all about, where Jesus tells him that he's equal with God, that he is God. And that's why he can do the things he does on Sabbath, because he created the Sabbath. He created the Sabbath for man, not the man for the Sabbath. Amen. Thank you for listening to my video. Please subscribe to my channel on YouTube. And please leave a comment in the comment sections. Uh, I appreciate everyone who listens and encourages me to keep going. And I hope that the information I give is learning, helping people learn and bringing them closer to God so we can glorify God together. Thank you. Amen.